What's your favorite form of exercise? All of us will have our own answers to that question. Walking, running, biking, swimming, skiing, tennis, lifting weights. Some people don't like to lift weights, but lifting weights is really good for us. And one weightlifting exercise is called a farmer's walk, where you take a dumbbell in each hand and you walk either for a certain distance or for a certain period of time. And it's a very good whole body exercise. It really gets your heart rate up and is really good for improving your grip strength and your arms and your shoulders. What do you think is the heaviest weight that you could carry in each hand for at least one minute? As you're thinking about that, I also want you to think about the World's Strongest Man competition in which the athletes do amazing things like lifting huge round stones weighing hundreds of pounds and even pulling trucks. Pulling trucks, it's incredible how much weight that they can move. But regardless of how much weight that you can carry in a farmer's walk or even how much weight the world's strongest man can lift, pull, or move, it's light compared to the weight of guilt we feel when we know we've done something wrong. And the discipline of confession relieves us from that crushing, destructive weight of guilt. That's what Psalm 32 tells us. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. And I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you. In the way, and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord. And rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. This is God's word for us for today. Psalm 32 begins by stating a fact. Happy or blessed are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. The first thing to know about confession is that forgiveness feels good. Forgiveness feels good when it comes to our sins, our errors, and mistakes. When we confess them and we're forgiven, it's like a weight is lifted off our shoulders. We release it to God and we don't have to strain under the burden of carrying them any longer. We, we release it to God. Forgiven literally means taken away as opposed to retained. And in talking about confession, first of all, we just have to acknowledge up front 
that some people don't see the need for it. For example, a person who has never felt the need to ask God for forgiveness, someone who doesn't believe in the concept of sin, or someone who, having made a mistake, lacks the decency to accept responsibility and confess regret, these sorts of people see no need for confession because they don't think they've done anything wrong, they don't feel any sense of remorse, and they don't feel accountable to God or to anybody else. Confession only benefits those who have the humility to recognize we make mistakes. And we fall short of who God wants us to be and who we desire to be. Confession lightens the burden of those who believe we serve a holy God who has high expectations, very high expectations of us, but also amazing love and grace for us. If we're a person of integrity, honesty, and faith, then unconfessed sin feels bad. And Psalm 32 in verses 3 and 4 describes the physical symptoms of one who is carrying around the weight of unconfessed sin. While I kept silence, while I kept it to myself, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me and my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. If you have ever sinned, and let me assure you, you have. If you've ever sinned and known it in here and not confessed it and not asked for forgiveness, then you know exactly what this psalm is describing. To know that weight and that groaning and that burden of, I've messed up, I messed up royally, and it's eating away at you. And release and relief come when we do what verse 5 says. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. And the rest of the psalm goes on simply to affirm God's caring, protection, deliverance, and steadfast love that surrounds those who trust in the Lord. And rather than living with the torment of unconfessed sin and guilt, we can, like the psalmist, confess, be forgiven, and be glad and rejoice in the Lord and shout for joy. Now what can happen is sometimes when we've made a mistake, our tendency can be to beat ourselves up over it rather than confessing it and moving on. And it isn't good for us to continually beat ourselves up or, and it's not good for anyone else either. It's not healthy and it's not helpful. Now, some people might wonder, well, what harm is there in not confessing our sins? Well, one result can be that powerful pent-up emotions of guilt, of fear, of shame, and anger, it can come out in negative ways that hurt other people, sometimes even total strangers or family members who had nothing to do with our real issue. And that can all happen because we won't face up to our responsibility. If we refuse to confess our sins and if we choose instead to bury our guilt and our pain and think that, well, no one else will be at risk, we're deceiving ourselves. For 43 years, the Nada Bragansova told people that there was a World War II bomb under her bed. And the story began in 1941 when the German army advanced toward the Ukrainian city of Berdansk. And one night at the very start of the battle, she was sitting by her window at her sewing machine and she suddenly heard a noise and a whistling close by. And she got up from her sewing machine and in a moment, she was struck by a blast of wind. And when she came to, the sewing machine was gone. And there was a hole in the floor and a hole in the ceiling. 
And Zenaida couldn't get any officials to check out her story. And so she just moved her bed over the hole and lived with it for the next 40 years. And finally, as phone cable was being laid in the area in the early 80s, (laughs) demolition experts were called in to find buried explosives. Where's your bomb, Grandma? asked a smiling Army lieutenant sent to talk to Mrs. Bragansova. No doubt under your bed. And Mrs. Bragansova answered dryly, yes, under my bed. Well, sure enough. They found a 500-pound, 43-year-old bomb. (laughs) And so, after evacuating 2,000 people from all the surrounding buildings, the bomb squad detonated the bomb. And according to the report, the grandmother, freed from her bomb, will soon receive a new apartment. I love that story. (laughs) But the truth is that there are many people who actually live like that grandmother with a bomb under their bed. Unconfessed sin. A terrible secret or a a simmering shame that lays there corroding for years while everyone goes about their business. And no one is safe or truly free until it is removed. Confession is a timely and relevant subject because there is so much that needs to be confessed, both individually and even as a nation. Yet we live in a time when there is little shame or remorse or even understanding of what is right and wrong. People engage in all seven of the deadly sins, pride, greed, lust, gluttony, wrath, envy, and sloth, without any remorse or regret. People lie and share lies without any concern for the consequences and the impact. And this is partially due to the age in which we live, where many people subscribe to the idea, well, you do your thing and I'll do mine. There's no truths that apply in all times and places. Believe whatever you want. And people say and do things that would make a sailor blush. And not only do people not feel guilty about it, they're almost proud and defiant about it. And the idea that what I do is my business and that it only impacts and concerns me and not other people is simply not true. Most of the good we do and most of the sin in our life directly involves influences and impacts other people and it indirectly influences many more and not only that but the scriptures teach us that when we wrong another person we not only wrong them we wrong God it is stunningly disappointing to me how many people in the public eye who claim to be Christians Live as if they have no fear of a holy God who commands us to live lives of love, justice, truth, and empathy. Some people also seem really happy to confess their neighbor's sins, which they themselves don't happen to commit, while being silent about the sin in their lives. Listen to Numbers chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the Israelites. When a man or woman wrongs another, breaking faith with the Lord, that person incurs guilt and shall confess the sin that has been committed. The person shall make full restitution for the wrong, adding one-fifth to it and giving it to the one who was wronged. Now again, we have to acknowledge That some people are so self-indulgent, so ignorant, or so evil that they have no sense of shame. They have no sense of remorse, no matter what they do. So the dynamic presence in these verses from Numbers describes what happens in a person who still has at least a bit of a conscience. (laughs) 
who's open to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Numbers says when we wrong another person, we not only wrong them, we wrong God. We break faith with the Lord. And as a result, we are guilty before God and we may feel guilty ourselves. And the solution involves two steps. The first is we have to confess the sin that's been committed. I always liked an old comic strip called Calvin and Hobbes about a little boy named Calvin and his stuffed tiger friend. And in the book, The Essential Calvin and Hobbes by Bill uh, Watterson, Calvin says in one comic to Hobbes, I feel bad that I called Susie names and hurt her feelings. I'm sorry I did it. Maybe you should apologize to her. <laughs> and you see the last, card, the last frame. I keep hoping there's a less obvious solution. You ever feel that way when you knew you needed to apologize and confess to someone? When we need to restore a relationship that we have harmed with God or with another person, the obvious solution is confessing. Confessing our wrong or our failure. And secondly, as far as possible, we make restitution to the person we've wronged. A shoplifter wrote to a department store a note that said, I just became a Christian and I can't sleep at night because I feel so guilty. So here's the hundred dollars I owe you. And he signed his name. And then he added a P.S. If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest of the money. <laughs> Guilt isn't good if all we do is wallow in it. Guilt is also not good if we only try half-heartedly to make amends. Guilt is good if it leads us to wholehearted confession, repentance, and restitution. And that's why our tool for today, I know some of you were wondering, is a paint scraper. And it's a nasty, big paint scraper, I might add. <laughs> you know, sometimes people can look fine on the outside, on the surface, but things on the inside are not good at all. This is the point that Jesus is making in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37, where he says, woe to you. Teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. And just like we can take a paint scraper and we can scrape away old paint and reveal the condition of the wood underneath. Confession, repentance and restitution can also help to reveal what's beneath the surface. And by exposing it, enables us to address it. You know, several of the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and other recovery groups that, and programs are, are built on this very spiritual process. In fact, steps five through 10 are all based on these same principles. Step five is we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. That's confession. And step eight is we made a list of all the persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. That's restitution, just like the Lord said to Moses in Numbers. And these are good steps for anyone to take when we have wronged someone else and need to confess our sin. One person who was going through step five wrote the following. Because God and I have an understanding, I'm free to bring my shortcomings to my spiritual friend. And when I admit my imperfections to myself, I give myself a chance to make room for new attitudes and directions. My willingness to look beyond my defensive view or my real or imagined hurts gives me release from the job of carrying them around. If I can search them out and look at them, I can put them down. Learning to trust and confide in another person 
means ridding myself of the prejudices I had acquired. My sponsor listened. Just listened. What a relief it gave me to unburden myself and what a sense of freedom I felt. That's what confession does for us. You know, many of the songs that we've sung today speak of the cross and of Jesus' sacrificial death. And we can't run away from the cost of the sins we need to confess, repent, and turn from. You know, some people don't like to think about the terrible death that Jesus endured, and for good reason. It was awful, excruciatingly painful, and humiliating. And yet that death on the cross is what makes forgiveness possible for you and for me. God takes our sin and our wrongdoing that seriously. God is faithful and just. God doesn't sit idly by while humanity damages and destroys itself. And the Creator provided an alternative conceived in the heart of God. And 1 John tells us it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. Jesus' blood shed on our behalf can free us from the burden of sin, relieving the crushing weight of guilt and restoring our relationship with God and with other people. Proverbs 28 verse 13 declares, no one who conceals transgressions will prosper, but one who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. No matter how strong we are, eventually we will grow tired from carrying around the weight of unforgiven, unconfessed sin. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Paul says in Romans chapter 3, and we've also fallen short of our own expectations. We all have failures and shortcomings, and this should make us both humble toward ourselves and understanding, gracious, and empathetic towards others. We're to remember that the church is a fellowship of sinners who are seeking to be forgiven and to grow in living Christ-centered lives. And I pray that all of us will be able to confess and release the sin that we are carrying today. May we be free, free from the sins, including the delusion that our sins aren't hurting anybody else when they're hurting ourselves, the heart of God, and most likely some other people too. If you're feeling led to speak with someone later today or in the days to come because of this message about confession and forgiveness, how should you proceed? Well, I want to suggest four quick things we all need to do. One is to say simply, I was wrong and accept responsibility with no evasion or excuses. Second, I'm sorry. Demonstrating genuine remorse and realizing the damage that's been done. Three, it won't happen again. This is where repentance comes into play and turning. We begin the process of rebuilding trust for the future. And fourth, asking, is there anything I can do to make it up to you? And this is performing deeds in keeping with repentance and restitution. I was wrong. I'm sorry. It won't happen again. Is there anything I can do to make it up to you? Those aren't a lot of words, but they're very powerful words. All of us who follow Jesus have this ministry of bringing God's forgiveness to one another. So may we be the kind of people who listen to the burdens of another person's heart and soul with love and mercy and with the uttermost trust and confidentiality. And I pray that we can also find such a person for ourselves to talk to as well. I want to invite you to join me as we go to a time of prayer and confession and open our hearts and our spirits to God. Hear first of all the words of 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 through 10 which says, if we say we have no sin, <laughs> we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we haven't sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I want to invite, invite you to join me in a time now of silent confession. Now I invite you to close your eyes, to be quiet, and in your heart, confess to God anything that you need to let go of. Any sin, anything that you know is wrong and it's been eating away at you, it's been sapping your strength and your joy, let's take this time now and confess to God in silence. And when we come out of that silence, we're going to join in a unison prayer of confession. Let's go to God now. Let's join together in this unison prayer of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And hear these words of assurance from 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. Amen.